So first up today with a whip through of leapfrog innovation, we've got a familiar face, IGF Founder Circle member Nikhil Kamath, longtime collaborator, friend of IGF. He's co-founder of Tech Unicorn online brokerage platform Zerodia and an asset management platform True Beacon. And most interestingly to me, the other day, I saw that he's launched the WTF Fund, which is investing in young entrepreneurs under the age of 22. So if you've got any of those here, this is your man. Right, Nikhil, over to you. Edie just told me I'm speaking on my own. I thought she was moderating. <laughs> but I have nine minutes with you guys. Uh, let me try and stick to what I think is relevant for India and the UAE today. Uh, I can't speak much about investing here uh, in the Middle East because I do not know enough. Uh, but presenting the opportunity of India, let me talk about some sectors that I find interesting and I'm actively looking at. And maybe that will help a UAE audience with a sovereign fund and lots of capital come into India a bit more easily. So a lot has changed in India over the last decade. Uh, notwithstanding the intricacies and nuances of working in India, I think the one big change that I have noticed is the, the funnel for money to come in from the Middle East to India has gotten significantly simpler. If people want to take exposure to India, which is probably the largest growing big democracy in the world today, uh, the means of doing it has become significantly simpler. As I see India today, I see three big opportunities that people in this region can participate in. Uh, the very first of them being uh, EVs, electric vehicles. India has seen adoption in the very early stages. I would say in two wheelers, we have seen adoption of about five to six percent, sub 10 percent, three wheelers much higher and commercial we are converting as well. Uh, I will go to the extent of talking about companies that I think are a great opportunity. There are two or three incumbent players in India who are doing well in EV. Uh, Ola leads the market with a 20-25% market share. Aether, another young company in India, has about 15%. The good thing about the EV industry in India today is it's quite cheap. Uh, you are able to get into these companies at a multiple of sales. In Aether's case, I would say as much as two, three times, four times. In Ola's case, it would be slightly higher, but these are multiples which are significantly cheaper than the West. If you were to look at a Tesla, for example, uh, and for a market which is as big as two-wheelers are in India, I think it's a great opportunity. Uh, and when you look at EVs, I don't think you limit them to scooters, uh, three-wheelers or trucks, but there are many ancillary opportunities around this. Uh, battery recycling, uh, looking at supplying parts that go into a cell in an EV. I think all of these uh, micro sectors in EV are a big opportunity in India. The second big opportunity that I'm looking at actively in India, I'm thinking me as an Indian living there, if I'm looking at something to invest in, will also make sense to you guys who are sitting outside of India. Uh, Education in a large way is getting disrupted in India. The way of our predecessors, the way our parents studied, I think going to college, getting a degree, uh, having that 15, 16 years of a vocation, which in turn will allow, you for, for, allow for you to apply for a job, is no longer as relevant as it was a decade ago in India. Uh, Companies are not is insisting upon people coming to them with a certain graduate degree and hiring based on that. That opens up the education industry to many tiny possibilities. Uh, education, in my opinion, is going to become a lot more fragmented than it is in India. Uh, we will not seek for that one institution to provide us with all our needs around education, there will be many different pockets, vocational training, vocational education, 
free stuff online uh, and investing around that in India, I think, will be a really big opportunity. Uh, the third big opportunity, and this is the last one I'm going to talk about, is content. Uh, a lot of people in India are adopting uh, or are getting access to the internet and smartphones, and this is happening very, very quickly. Uh, to give you an example of how much a content creator earns in India, uh, on a relative basis compared to the US, we make about $1 for every $10 that an American makes. As the GDP per capita in India were to go up, the amount of money content creators make will go up proportionately. And I think this in turn uh, will give many opportunities for investment in influencer uh, platforms, which could be around monetization, which could be around finding a brand, the right kind of influencer as well. So I wanted to open up the conversation on these three broad topics which I think are relevant and timely for people looking to get allocation into India today. With that, you know, I want this to be more interactive, so I'm going to open it up to questions and uh, ED had suggested we can pass a mic around if that works. I have five minutes left, so we could do questions for five. Yeah? Thank you very much. And I think you are correctly right for the education part. People here are looking for a lot of coders, a lot of areas in technical terms. You mentioned that it will be vocational institutions available. Do you have anything such in mind for any vocational training for EVs or batteries for people to do this? Because as we have mechanics for cars, mm -hmm. maybe it's a big opportunity for somebody to start here. Because Abu Dhabi has started manufacturing their own EVs. So probably you can give some highlight on that. Yeah, so me personally, I'm looking at this more as an investor, investing into people who are building great content. But if you're able to translate what learnings Abu Dhabi has had as, as a region in EVs into India, and you know, you could do it via the internet, the open sourced internet, and I think there will be a lot of opportunities there. I can't tell you what specifically, but there are very many people in India wanting to know how they can start a business in EV. And maybe there are use cases in Abu Dhabi that can be replicated there. So if you put out content about what is working here, I'm sure you will find help for that in India. Thank you. Hi, Nikhil. Uh, your question, like, you know, you talked about the EV, uh, adding to what gentleman had said. Because UAE is a place or a home for GCC and Africa, and IGF represents Africa here as well. Yes, two-wheeler is very big in India, and there are over 50,000 delivery bikes over here, but all are the mechanical engine or the combustion engine. As India is so developed in the EV, it could be a great opportunity because uh, the Teslas or every manufacturer is launching a EV brand here. Example, the Chinese brands mm -hmm. come here, do their global launch in UAE. So is there, as like, you know, uh, the ambassador mentioned about, it's a two-way, right, relationship. Could those EV manufacturers and the battery operators set up a plant here or launch their vehicles here? There's a great opportunity. From here, it could be an entire GCC in Africa. So I'm just saying is like, there is a great opportunity as you uh, are funding into these uh, technologies or so on, and there could be a great opportunity in this part of the world. Yeah, I agree with you. I think the opportunity is both ways. Uh, ironic it, as it might sound, I think I take Ubers here in Dubai all the time, and each time I book Uber, a certain type of Uber, I see a Tesla come by and pick me up. I've always wondered why this region of all is trying to adopt EVs as quickly as they are, because it's, uh, it's a very meta way of thinking, right? This is an oil-based economy largely, this region, and EVs are not essentially, you, one would not assume they would be the first ones to adopt it. But yeah, I think your idea is great, and uh, as the world gets more fragmented, like it seems to be getting right now, I think uh, a parallel, EV company between UAE and India can find a lot of value. Hi, Nikhil. Thanks for that. Um, 
I just want to know, like, what are your insights on or two bit on fintech and how much regulation is good regulation or not? Um, and thoughts on India and also given that, you know, this region is aggressively looking at that industry as well. Um, any sort of collaboration, anything that exists or one could leverage? So I'll be candid about this. Fintech is having a bad moment today. Uh, especially in India, if you are a fintech company today, compared to say two years ago, uh, access to capital has gotten significantly harder. That, that is the story on the ground. Uh, a big part of that could be people overestimated how quickly adoption will happen for fintech products in India. Uh, most people who are able to do okay in fintech today seem to be the guys who are lending. Uh, I hope all of that changes and uh, in my opinion, India is a large market and with time adoption will pick up. Uh, but yeah, I think it's a tough time. Like, uh, I don't know how else to put this. Like, if you were in Bangalore trying to raise money for a fintech company today, uh, if you got a Series A check which was X one year ago today, you will probably get 0.25 of X. I don't, I don't really have a unique insight there, but it is a tough time. Yes, Manoj. Hi, Nikhil. I thought let me also uh, get this opportunity to ask you a question. So I'm looking on the screen here, the title of your session, there's two questions I had. The first one I don't think I want the answer to is what do the initials <laughs> WTH stand for? Young people like me and Mohandas Pai were really, would be very confused by that. <laughs> the second uh, question, uh, the more pertinent question is, is what is leapfrog technology in your innovation in your view? I remember when we had this conversation uh, pre-IGF, me and Manoj were on call and I told him as IGF we should not use complicated words, we should remove leapfrog from the dictionary altogether because… I just wanted uh, <laughs> WTF. <laughs> no, I mean uh, leapfrog in particular I don't resonate with, I don't… I feel like there is so much going on in the world but all kinds of innovation is incremental in nature. I was just looking at the new AI development, the QSTAR thing and how that model is getting built. Uh, I'm no expert at this, right? Like uh, I'm just being uh, maybe like a little bit more candid than I should be. But a lot has changed in AI, but the way we are talking about it today seems to be an exaggeration as to uh, there is a big gap between what is going on on the ground and in the manner in which we are talking about it. Uh, so the one big innovation which is season, seasonal right now is artificial intelligence. And I think uh, early days, because this paper came out four days ago, but uh, a program which can learn and solve math problems on its own, elementary level math problems, in the manner that it is doing right now, I think that could be the next big innovation depending on how it plays out. But four days ago is too soon to call it, I guess. I think uh, Sachin will have an opinion about it. You, you should answer that question too. Yeah. He, he can answer in his session. We'll leave that for just a few moments, Nikhil. <laughs> All right, Manoj says yes. Earlier on in the year was um, Indian regulation blocked all payment gateways overnight, no notice. Out of 50 people approved, 49 could no longer take on new customers. What is your advice for global operators that are trying to operate in India to deal with this rapid inconsistency that keeps going on in India? Leave it to your friend to try and get an answer that could get you into trouble. Yeah, I, I think History has taught us that overregulation. I'm looking at him while I'm answering this question. History has kind of taught us that overregulation has not been good for capitalism. It has also taught us that socialism is worse off than capitalism. Uh, are we nearing that point, especially in fintech, since someone asked me the question? Uh, I think a lot of what the Indian regulators have done in the last couple of years have been net-net 
good for the ecosystem. Uh, it has stopped us from getting into trouble when the Western markets did in many tiny ways. But are we nearing that point today, not just in finance, but in many different domains that uh, we could say is nearing over-regulation? Might be. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I aspire to live in an India which is both capital account, current account convertible. Uh, there is so much appetite in a bleak, in an otherwise bleak world. People are so sanguine about India. I think that if we were to become truly convertible, in my opinion, more money would come in than go out. Uh, and like other Western developed economies, uh, that should ideally be the path long term. Mohan has an opinion? I think. Yeah, please. We've got to stop. I'm really sorry. I'm getting a lot of crossness in my ears. Next session is, is, needs to happen. Nikhil, you're here all day, right? Okay, all right. Well, <laughs> thank you. Huge round of applause for Nikhil Kamath. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.